Suppose a coin is tossed a hundred times and the number of heads is 70. Is the coin biased? How do we go about solving this problem? Let's look at key information that's provided to us. So we know that this is a coin toss. And when we're dealing with coin toss, we have two potential outcomes. We have heads or tails. And if the coin is an unbiased coin, then the probability of getting heads is 50%. The probability of getting tails is also 50%. Now this coin, and now we don't really know whether this is a biased or unbiased coin or not. And this coin is tossed a hundred times. And that's a crucial information. So what this means is that the sample size is 100 and the number of heads is 70. So out of those 100 tosses, the number of heads that you end up getting is 70. So x equals 70. So what this means is that if you toss 100 times and your outcome is 70, then the probability or the proportion of heads of this particular coin is going to be 0.7 or 70 divided by 100. Now the question asks us the following. How do we determine is the, if the coin is biased or not? Now a common approach, uh, which is an incorrect approach that most people think about, is approaching this problem like um, using the Bayes theorem. Now that would make sense, you know, in terms of trying to compute the probability that a coin is biased or unbiased, given that you have this particular outcome, meaning you have 70 heads out of 100 trials. However, though, the, we're not trying to compute what is a probability that it is either biased or unbiased. That's not the ex purpose of this exercise. Now, that would only make sense if you're doing something like um, Bayesian statistics uh, as a replacement for you know, statistical inference. But in this case, what we're going to use is um, a frequentist approach as a way to validate or evaluate whether this coin is biased or not. So how are we going about doing that? Let's zoom in on the fact that if this coin is unbiased and you toss it 100 times, then approximately you should get about 50% of those coins being heads. But in this case, we have about 70%. But in this case, we have 70%. So when you think about this, you could evaluate this using statistical inference, where you evaluate whether the outcome of interest is an extreme situation compared to the, you know, what is to be expected. Essentially, you would try to calculate what your p-value is and evaluate that against your significance level. And if this extreme value crosses that significance level, then it is suggestive that yes, there is statistical significance in terms of the coin being biased. So how do we properly set this up? Let's start by setting the hypothesis statements, which is the step one to setting up the hypothesis test. So the step one, we have the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that the probability of heads is 0.5. And this is going to be this, the statement or the proxy that we use to say that the coin is unbiased. Now, for the alternative hypothesis, this is going to be that the probability of heads is not 0.5. In other words, essentially what we're saying is that the coin is biased. So now that we've set up the hypothesis statements, where do we go from there? We have to now think about what is the statistical test or the statistical model we're going to use in order to evaluate the event that we have observed. Is this event statistically significant or not? Now there, there are of course various tests that you could consider. You could consider t-tests, z-tests, maybe even some non-parametric tests like chi-score tests. In this case, the test that we're going to use is one sample z-test or two-tailed one sample z-test. Now let me talk about exactly why we're going to be using 
two-tailed, one simple z-test. Now we're considering that it is going to be two-tailed because we don't really know whether the outcome of interest is going to swing uh, on the left side of the distribution or the right side of the distribution. If we have strong assumption that the outcome is going to be on one of the side, then we're going to use one-sided uh, tests considering the direction in mind. But in this case, we're agnostic to that, so we're going to use two-tailed tests. What about in terms of the one sample? Why is it one sample, not two sample? Well, think about what we're evaluating here. We're not saying we've run some sort of an A-B experiment where you have a control condition and a treatment condition and you evaluate whether these two groups are essentially different or not. We already have some underlying information about the population of interest, and that is going to be the um, unbiased coin. And we know what the true proportion is going to be, and we know what the variance is going to be. So we're essentially evaluating the sample that we got, which is 100, right? 100 trials, and we have 70 heads. We're evaluating that against the population of interest. So that's why we're using one sample Z test. And the other information I just want to provide is that we already know what the variance is, and that's, that is something that I'm going to talk about. And that's why we're using Z test as opposed to T test. And of course, the other um, consideration in mind is that um, you know you use Z test when uh, your sample size is greater than 30 in this case. And that's what we do have. We have our sample size that is 100, exceeding that general rule of thumb that helps you guide whether you should be using Z-test or T-test. So now that we have that out of the way, and that is something that you know an interviewer may sometimes ask, why is it that the choice of your statistical test happens to be two-tailed, one-sample Z-test? Um, then this is the type of justification you may need to provide. Now let's take a look at the formula for two-tailed, one-sample Z-test. It is going to be the Z naught, or Z observed in this case, equals the P hat minus P divided by our variance here, or this is going to be the standard deviation, which is P times one minus P, the complement of P, divided by N. All right, so what are each of these values here? Well, this p hat is going to be 0.7. This p is going to be 0.5. Um, and then we just see, and then the n is going to be 100. So we just need to plug in the values. And then we're going to end up with what the z naught is going to be. So when we do that, what we have is 0.7 minus 0.5 divided by square root of 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 100. Now I'm sure this top part makes sense, right? We're comparing um, the outcome that we have observed, which is 0.7 uh, minus you know, the, the, the true um, proportion of getting heads if the coin were to be um, unbiased, which is gonna be 0.5. Now you might be wondering though, why is it that for the variance case, this is going to be 0.5 and not 0.7. Well, that's because this Z statistic is, um, the, the underlying distribution is the null distribution. So if you remember statistic, statistical, so if you remember statistical test 101, the underlying distribution for the null distribution uh, is going to be the null distribution or whatever is the parameter of its null distribution, in this case, the proportion of heads is 0.5, that is going to be the mean in this case. And what we're trying to see is that, okay, we have observed this particular event, and under the assumption that the, um, that the proportion of heads is 0.5, what is the probability of observing this particular event where the P uh, being uh, P of heads being 0.7, you know, what is the probability of observing that under this distribution, right? And if this probability is less than the significance level, which is typically 
uh, 0.025 under you know uh, the two-tailed case in this you know in this particular instance, then we would essentially reject the the null hypothesis, um, and that's why we're using the variance based on the distribution coming from the null distribution and not necessarily from uh, by plugging in 0.7. All right, so when we simplify this function, um, what we essentially get is 0 0.20 on the top and 0 0.50 divided by 10. And this essentially simplifies to 4.0. Now, how do we further evaluate whether this 4.0 is actually statistically significant or not. And we could use, you know, if we have access to it, some, you know, a Z table um, in order to convert that to p-value. Um, but one thing that you probably want to just retain on the back of your mind for interviewing in general is that the corresponding um, significance level or the Z critical value, right? So you could also evaluate it using Z critical value. You know, for a given alpha, you know, let's just say 0 0.05, um, what is going to be the Z score that corresponds to the region where you're able to capture a rejection region that is going to be, you know, 0 0.05? And that happens to be 1.96. Now that significance level is 0 0.05, but keep in mind that we're doing two tails, so that gets split into two such that you have 0 0.025 on one side of the region and the other side of the region also gets 0 0.025 combining, giving you that total of that alpha being 0 0.50. Now it turns out that the Z critical value, you know, for this alpha uh, on one of the side in this case is going to be 1.96. So now we can evaluate whether the Z observed that we have, we, we got is more or is is higher or less than the z critical values because if we have two regions we have a z critical value here and we have another z critical value on the left tail um, of this distribution right and we do see that 4.0 is higher than 1.96 so z naught is higher than the z critical value on the right side so, so therefore we can conclude that there is statistical significance that the coin is biased. And that's how we go about solving this problem.